back in the late 80s and early 90s, I was a Nintendo fan, to say the least. I think the sweatsuit says it all. By the time 1991 rolled around, I had to make the tough decision between getting a Sega Genesis or the brand new Super Nintendo Entertainment System. After much deliberation, I opted for the Super Nintendo and never really regretted my decision other than not being able to play Sonic the Hedgehog. I played my Nintendo systems in my little Bobby's World of Nintendo and Super Nintendo corner that I had set up in my parents' basement. And yep, that is why my YouTube channel is called World of Nintendo Today. By 1993, Sega's mudslinging ad campaign, which continually made the Super Nintendo out to look like the game system for babies, had really started to get to me, and I became a full-blown Super Nintendo fanboy. I made a Sega recycling bin in which I put any and all Sega ads that I found, making sure to rip them up first, of course. I also made a Sega Genesuck sign, and a Super Nintendo shirt that pandered to Nintendo's The Best Play Here advertising slogan of the early 90s. Super Nintendo was perfect, and no one could tell me any differently. Sega's TV ads about its blast processing made me doubt the superiority of my chosen system. But those doubts were laid to rest once Nintendo Power published an article in its June 1993 issue that compared each system's specs side by side. I was relieved to see that the Super Nintendo bested the Genesis in all categories except processor speed, which really did cause slowdown problems in such games as Super Castlevania IV, but I digress. This article allowed me to continue thinking that my Super Nintendo was the flawless system that I wanted it to be. However, as I would soon learn 20 years later, the Super Nintendo really does have a design flaw, and not just because of the yellow discoloration of the console's plastic shell that is now such a common problem. So here it is now. 20 years after some of the home videos were taken that you saw the still pictures from in my video. And yeah, my Super Nintendo has yellowed quite a bit. Well, the bottom half has anyway. Uh, but that's not the flaw I'm going to be taking a look at and attempting to fix in this video. There are a lot of videos on YouTube of people who have, well, to varying degrees of success, uh, reversed the chemical reaction that causes the yellowing on the Super Nintendo console. But uh, if you want to check those out, just uh, search Yellow Super Nintendo on YouTube. There are several videos about that. What I am going to be taking a look at in this video um, is a flaw that I did notice 20 years ago, but at the time... I thought it was because of my TV. Back then I hooked my Super Nintendo up to my 19 inch MGA CRT TV using the uh, RF switch here that I have that uh, Nintendo provided. And the reason I used uh, the RF switch is because, well, number one, is it was what Nintendo provided uh, with uh, the console. And number two, it was really the only way to get a video signal into that particular TV. Uh, if you've seen my Nintendo Connected series of videos, you know uh, that the RF switch provides the poorest quality video signal because it broadcasts over channel 3 or 4. And little did I know at the time, the poor video signal uh, as a result of the RF switch was actually masking the flaw that uh, I saw with my Super Nintendo picture on my TV. But now that I connect my Super Nintendo uh, to an, a higher-end TV, with an S-Video connection, which is this one here. The flaw that I'm going to be taking a look at as far as the video signal output is even more noticeable. So let's take a look. In order to do that, we're going to have to turn the lights off and turn the console on. So let's get that going. All right, two things you're probably aware of now that you weren't before. Number one, this is Super Metroid. It's the game we're taking a look at. And number two, you can probably figure out now what the uh, flaw in the video signal is. And it takes the form of that vertical band going down the, pretty much the center of the screen. It's actually a little bit to the left of the center of the screen. And I picked Super Metroid to take a look at uh, because it has a very dark atmosphere. And this particular game, Super Metroid, uh, tends to be dark. You're going to notice that um, uh, the flaw, the vertical band, is most noticeable on all black screens, like this one. But it is also noticeable on uh, lighter screens as well. 
This particular scene right here is rather bright with that light gray background, but if you take a look at the status bar up top, it is black, and you can see the bar uh, kind of to the left of center there. Now here, this particularly dark screen, we don't see it uh, too much. And as a matter of fact, the, um, the missiles are kind of masking it. See that uh, 15 missile count right there? The brightness from those pixels is kind of uh, masking, masking the flaw. But every time we have a cutscene, you notice the band. And here you can see it even more. As I'm looking through the viewfinder on my camera, uh, it's pronounced quite a bit more through uh, the viewfinder here than it actually is on screen. It isn't nearly as prominent when I'm looking at it. But my goal here is to um, repair the system so that this vertical band uh, is as minimally noticeable as possible. And the way we're going to go about doing this, I'm lucky enough to have my friend uh, who's an electronic engineer here helping me uh, with this mod or repair, however you look at it. Uh, we're going to be adding capacitors uh, to either or both of the voltage regulator in the uh, Super Nintendo Entertainment System or uh, the graphic, uh, graphic processor chip. There's a video uh, of another YouTube user uh, who's already done this process and he kept adding capacitors until he got the desired effect. Well, of course, my friend and I sat down and watched that video and we've bought the capacitors and uh, we're going to see. He has a theory that uh, it's not going to be necessary to put uh, capacitors on the voltage regulator and the uh, graphic processor, but rather uh, just the graphic processor itself. But uh, once we get to that footage, I'll let you know the specifics of that, and I'll show you before and after to see uh, how effective our little uh, mod is of adding capacitors to try to get rid of this uh, vertical line. So before I open up the console and get it ready to perform the repair, I thought it'd be a good idea to mention that the vertical band problem doesn't affect all Super Nintendo consoles. It's mainly a problem for older versions like the one that I have on the left here. From what I understand, this is because Nintendo made various changes to the internal components as the console progressed throughout its life cycle, and the signal from the video encoder chip experienced less and less interference with each iteration of the hardware. As a result, most newer versions of the console, including the redesigned Super Nintendo that was released in 1997, have little to no issue with this vertical band interference in the video signal. So then, you may ask, why do I want to do this repair if I already have a newer model of the Super Nintendo? and the redesigned version of the Super Nintendo. Well, number one, I'm partial to the original version. I love my original version. All the original features, such as the cartridge lock right here, are intact. And uh, once we look under the hood, you're going to see that the audio hardware is superior as it's contained within its own shielded module. Also, the redesigned Super Nintendo console doesn't output an S-video signal without modification. You also want to keep in mind that not all newer looking models of the Super Nintendo are free of the vertical band problem. Some of the newer looking versions, like this one here that has the word eject embossed in the plastic of the eject button instead of printed on it with white paint, has this sticker right here and doesn't have the cartridge lock. Uh, some of them do have the problem still, and that's because of the configuration of the chips on the motherboard. This all boils down to what version of the motherboard your Super Nintendo console has. So, speaking of the insides, let's open them up. I've already removed the six security bits that hold the console together, and I've removed all the standard Phillips screws that secure the internal components. If you're interested in the teardown process, check out my Nintendo Torn Down series of videos. So, we're, I've already got this uh, lifted off, or uh, unscrewed here, so we'll lift it off. Set it to the side. Over here, lift off the top. Set it to the side. And right away you can see what I was talking about with uh, the audio module. This older version here, uh, from what I understand, has superior audio output because of this uh, isolated and dedicated soundboard versus the integrated chip right here of, of the newer version. So in order to do this mod, we're going to be taking a look at two chips inside. And since we're going to be dealing only with the older model, I'm going to remove the newer model. 
So the repair we're going to be doing is based off a procedure we saw in a video from another YouTube user. And uh, his method involved two components on the board here. The first of which was the uh, voltage regulator, which can be found right here. And what we're going to do is add a capacitor. We have these right here. Got 220 microfarad, 25 volt capacitors. We're going to be uh, adding those to the uh, output in the ground pins of the uh, voltage regulator. And uh, what uh, he did, he kept adding capacitors of increasing value to both the voltage regulator here and the video encoder chip right here. And uh, what my friend's theory is, my friend who's going to be helping me uh, do this repair, is that it's only going to be necessary to put uh, the capacitors on the video encoder chip. What we're going to do is put the uh, capacitor 5 volts to ground on this uh, video encoder that's hidden right, uh, right underneath the, uh, the shield piece right here. And uh, the numbers on these, this uh, particular video encoder is BA6592F. And uh, that varies significantly uh, as far as the model number goes uh, for each version of the Super Nintendo hardware. So you're going to want to pay attention to that and look up the data sheet uh, for that particular video, uh, video encoder that you have. This uh, voltage regulator is uh, pretty uniform throughout every iteration of the Super Nintendo hardware, and that's a 7805. But basically, from what I understand, we're going to be uh, removing some uh, interference, video noise, uh, that's going along the uh, 5 volt rail here um, from the voltage regulator if we choose to do that and then of course the uh, video encoder. So here we go. So here we are soldering the uh, capacitor to the video encoder 5 volts to ground. On the video encoder pin 5 Doing the positive on the capacitor, and then pin 2 on the video encoder, the negative of the capacitor. Alright, so there's a capacitor on that video encoder chip right there. Don't have the system fully back together yet, but I'm going to put in Super Metroid, just like you saw before. Switch it on over here, and see what we got. A lot fainter of a vertical line. Still there, but to be honest, I can see it a lot better through the camera viewfinder than I can actually looking at the TV with just my eyes. So I'm making my friend put a voltage uh, or a, uh, a capacitor on the voltage regulator and see if that can get rid of the uh, vertical line even more. You know, unlike the capacitor for the video encoder, we were worried about how much room we were going to have uh, to fit it underneath uh, the board and uh, on top of the shielding that it's going to be on. But we found out that the space uh, between the bottom of the board and the bottom of the shielding is perfect to fit the capacitor. So we're going to put it on the bottom of the board instead of the top. Here we are soldering the capacitor to the output and the ground with the voltage regulator on the underside of the board. All right, so now we have a capacitor on both the voltage regulator and the video encoder. Got Metroid in the system. Turn it on and see what we got. Very minimal, almost non-existent. I don't even think I can see it now through the video finder as far as that vertical line goes. Maybe just a very little bit. But again, I can't see it uh, just looking at the TV with my eyes, which is the important thing. Plus, once we put the uh, voltage or the uh, capacitor on the voltage regulator, uh, some noise in the background on a black screen has gone away, which is fantastic. So overall, it looks like this mod works. 
You could probably get away with satisfactory results putting a capacitor only on the video encoder, but if you wanted to take it as far as putting it on the voltage regulator too, looks like you're going to get even better results. So there you go. Vertical band vanquished. Before I end it, I just wanted to show a side-by-side -side before and after comparison in a dark room. On the left you see footage of an unmodded launch model of the Super Nintendo running Super Metroid. On the right you see the same footage running on my newly modded launch model. Overall, I'd say this mod is fairly easy to do if you know how to solder or if you know someone who does. Thankfully, it's not an essential mod since the vertical band is noticeable only on all black screens or in games that have a lot of dark environments. For obsessive perfectionists like myself, however, it's certainly a desirable improvement. If you have a Super Nintendo console, hopefully your particular model won't benefit from performing this repair mod. If so, maybe you want to try it out for yourself. Comment below, were you already aware of this common flaw with the Super Nintendo hardware? Do you plan to perform this repair mod on your own console? Let me know. Either way, I hope this video was informative and helpful. Thanks for watching. Thank you.